Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today we're getting enthusiastic about plurals. But first, it's our anniversary! Every year in November, we celebrate another year of enthusiastic linguistics podcasting. And this year, we are celebrating by asking you to share your favorite fact about linguistics that you learned from Lingthusiasm. So if there's a story or a fact or an anecdote that you find yourself retelling to people saying, hey, I learned it from this podcast, tell that to people on social media. We've been having so much fun seeing your responses already. Keep doing it till the end of November and help us celebrate our third anniversary. And we will reshare them, and you can find other people's as well to share yourself. Most people still find podcasts from recommendations from trusted friends and acquaintances. So sharing your enthusiasm for linguistics with people is the best way for the show to find new ears. This month's bonus episode is all about reading fiction like a linguist. Um, a bit like podcasts, I get a lot of my fiction reading suggestions from you, Gretchen, and we talk about what it's like to read fiction through the eyes of a linguist. So all of the linguistically interesting angles and facts and aspects of the fiction we've been reading recently uh, in this episode, we also have over 30 bonus episodes. That's almost half the show. So if you've been looking for more quality linguistics content in your life and you've listened to all the back episodes of Lingthusiasm, there is more. We have a solution. You don't have to stop listening. Uh, you can get access to these instead. Just go to patreon.com slash Lingthusiasm. And thanks for people who are already supporting us for helping keep the show going and ad-free. Not only can you read linguistic C fiction, but you can also wear your Lingthusiasm with our new merch. You can wear Lingthusiasm patterns, including the International Phonetic Alphabet, the Esoteric Symbols, and the Tree Diagrams on your feet with the new Lingthusiasm socks. I mean, you could have worn them on your feet with the scarf, but that would have been strange. Uh, the socks fit much better. <laughs> wear the socks on your feet. Don't wear scarves and ties and mugs on your feet. We also have greeting cards with IPA thanks and congratulations on them, but uh, definitely don't wear them at all. Yes. Plus, uh, we have t-shirts, baby outfits, various other kinds of Lingthusiasm merch. If you go to lingthusiasm.com slash merch, you can check out photos of all of those and get them for yourself or for a linguist or linguistics enthusiast in your life. Okay, Gretchen, it's grammar time. Okay. What is the difference between these two words? You ready? Okay. The first one is book. Mm hmm. And the second one is books. Oh, I know this one. I know this one. We're good. Uh, okay. So the first one is when you just have one book. And the second one, books, is when you have more than one book. How did I do? You did great. Congratulations. Okay, good. Thank you. I am a speaker of English. Your English speaker intuitions are working as expected. That's good to know, seeing as we're speaking English right now. <laughs> but this is plurals. You have, sometimes you have just one of something, you have a singular, sometimes you have a plural of something. And in English, the kind of classic way that you form a plural is by adding an S or this S sound to the end of a word. We've talked about morphology in a previous episode, which is where you add bits to a word to create more meaning. And plurals are just a really nice bit of morphology in English. I'm very fond of them. I like being able to distinguish between whether I have one book or many books. Hopefully all the books. Yes, ideally more than one book. I think that's the appeal of plurals. <laughs> they just more more than one book, more than one cake. You know, it, it just makes everything better. But there are also other ways of making plurals, uh, not just by adding uh, an s or you know s z sound if you have dogs. Um, in English, sometimes you make the plural by, for example, if I have the word foot and I have the word feet. Uh, Lauren, what's the difference between these? Mm. I'm I'm just going to observe that there is no s there, but the second word definitely means more than one foot. It does, because English also forms plural by changing the vowels sometimes, particularly for words that go back to Old English and have this, what's called the Germanic ablaut pattern, but of changing the vowels to indicate a different sort of grammatical thing. So the fact that some plurals in English 
form by changing their vowels was actually really helpful to me back when I was studying Arabic in undergrad, because in Arabic sometimes you add an ending to make something plural, but in a lot of cases what you actually do instead is you change all of the vowels and sometimes even the associations of how many vowels there are or which consonants come together. So for example, if you have the Arabic word kitab, which means book. Mm -hmm. There's also the word kutub, which means books. And so in this case, you've changed the e a vowel pattern, that's a short e and a long a, to just two short u's, kutub. Kitab, kutub. Hmm. It's a little bit like English foot and fate. A little bit, except that it's changing kind of two vowels for the price of one, and in this case it's a bit more complex as a whole system. This is definitely an oversimplification to say that it works the same way as foot feet, but the fact that the vowels change is something that's kind of neat. And one thing that I found particularly interesting about this system is that it can also apply to words that get borrowed into Arabic. So Arabic has the word false, which means money, mm -hmm. and the plural of it is fulus. So you take this FLS set of consonants, and instead of just having the single A there, you have oo and then a long oo. Okay, right. that's fine. But then Arabic borrowed the word bank from English, which is pronounced bank. As in like a money bank? Like a money bank, not a river bank. And the plural of bank, because it looks kind of like false, it's got, you know, consonant and then an A and then two more consonants. So the plural yep. of bank in Arabic is bunuk, like fulus. Mm. You put oo and then long oo in between the, the three consonants. How clever. I always enjoy it so much when languages take a word from another language and then adapt it to the morphology of their language and say, okay, we figured out how to plural it, we know how to pluralize words like this, we're going to do this the way that, that our language does it. In fact, Nepali borrowed the word kitab from Arabic, uh, and it uses, instead of using the Arabic form of the plural, uh, so in Nepali you have one kitab, mm -hmm. but you have two kitab haru. Ah. So they also have a suffix at the end of the word like English does, but they don't use the Arabic form of the word. But if you're listening to people speak Nepali every day, you can often hear to kitab, and it's just as grammatical as to kitab haru. So it's not like in English where the S is obligatory if something is plural. You can just put the haru if you want it or if, if it's necessary, but you can also omit it. Yes. Whereas Hindi, which also borrowed kitab, um, Hindi has obligatory plurals, and so one kitab and two kitabe. So closely related languages, you can't trust them to always have the same obligatoriness or not. And what's interesting, so Arabic was very influential in a lot of different areas because mm -hmm. another language that borrowed the word for book from Arabic was Kinyarwanda, which is spoken in Rwanda. Um, and it slightly adapted the form of the word instead of being kitab, it borrowed it as igitabo because Kinyarwanda really likes words to begin and end with vowels. And in Kinyarwanda, there's also a prefix igi, uh, which means that something is singular and belongs to a particular class. And if you want to make something that begins with igi plural, you change igi to ivi. So igitabo is book, and ivitabo, with the b, is books, because you always change igi to ivi to make something plural, and they just took the same pattern that they had in their language and said, yeah, we can, we can do this with this word from this other language. What an exciting life the word kitab has had. It feels like very poetic that the word for book traveled around a lot. You know, it was a technology the way that a lot of languages have borrowed the English word for computer. A lot of languages borrowed the Arabic word for book because the Arabics were some early people to have books. So, so far we've had, um, you can put a suffix on the end of a word. Kinyawanda has some prefixing at the start of a word. So where the morphology is, um, Arabic and sometimes English involves some internal changes. You're not necessarily just adding or removing something from the start or the end. Mm -hmm. These are some of the strategies for pluralizing, but they're not the only ones. What else can we do? One thing that I find very satisfying as, as a plural strategy is where you repeat the word and the repetition is what makes it um, indicate that it's a plural. That's very economical. It makes a lot of sense. So it's like saying book and book book to mean several book. Yeah. Indonesian is one of the widely spoken languages that does this. So the word for student is murid, but the word for students plural is murid murid as one option for how to pluralize it. Ah, very nice. And there's something very visual about that form of plural that I find very satisfying. Speaking of languages that form their plural with a the prefix, there's actually an analysis of French. So traditionally speaking, if you learn French in school, you learn like French forms a plural by changing the ending, the same way that English does. Mm -hmm. But in actual fact, in French, often those S's at the end are silent. Pretty much always. Right. 
And so there's another analysis of French whereby it's actually that the plural is a prefix. Okay. And this especially shows up in French words that begin with vowels. From children who are learning French before they learn to read and write, they often assume that many words in French that begin with a vowel actually have plural prefixes. So if you take, for example, the word ami, which means friend in French, and the plural of it is also ami, but with an S at the end, but you can't hear the S. No, I could not hear that. <laughs> it is completely silent. There's nothing to hear. Um, most of the time when you say uh, a word in French, you put another word in front of it. And especially for uh, a noun, you're often going to put an article like the or my or something in front of it. So you would say l'ami, the friend, les amis, the friends. And that's les, which is the plural form of the, but it has this S that's silent. And because that silent S is before words that begins with a vowel, you pronounce that S like a Z. Huh. Yeah. And so the same thing with my friend, you have mon ami. Me zemi. And again, that A makes the S in me, which is also the plural form of my, be pronounced as if it's actually there. I can totally see how as a child. Uh, you can see where this is going, right? Because like you don't actually speak French and you're like, uh oh, it really sounds like the singular is ami and the plural is zami. Exactly, zami. So you get little kids, it's really cute when they're learning to write, they'll be like me zami and they'll write like Z A M I. <laughs> For, for for friends. Okay, that is too cute. <laughs> I have friends who like post this is what their like young children are doing on Facebook, uh, like little notes that they're writing for class. They're talking about Lady Zemi. <laughs> it's so cute. Kids are just great little paradigm analyzers, aren't they? Well, and this is the kind of way that language change could happen because you could imagine if French wasn't a written language, or if so, you know some sort of catastrophe happened and French people weren't writing anymore. You had a an area of French where they had stopped writing for a while and they started writing again. You could imagine that people would have reanalyzed it at this point. Like, this is actually what's marking plural in the spoken version of French, even though the writing is preserving this other thing. Uh, and if you were to start writing it differently in the modern era, uh, not looking at what it did historically, then it would be very sensible to say that the plural is actually zemi. I think it's also worth just mentioning that there are plenty of languages that get by just fine without any plural morphology adding onto words at all. Yeah, absolutely. But I think all languages have some way of expressing whether they're different amounts of stuff. The question is just, do you do this, you know, as an intrinsic part of particular words, or do you do this with extra words? You know, you could say in English, one book, two book, many book, uh, a few book, and these words would convey also that there's more than one book as well. This is what a lot of Austronesian and Pacific Island languages do, uh, and they get by obviously completely fine. So, for example, tetum, which is the language of Timor, if they need to mark something as plural, they'll just use a separate word, which is sira or they. So, again, they're using the determiners a bit like uh, French children use when they can't hear the difference between the plural and the single form. Yeah, I mean, spoken French just completely uses the determiners to indicate what's plural. Um, it's just in the writing. We've talked about determiners and how they have a lot of work to do for tiny words. Yeah. This is just another thing they get to do, overachieving. <laughs> yeah, sometimes your, your the word can, can take on that function instead, or you can, you know, use overt number words, or you can do things like, you know, for English words like rice or bread, uh, you end up using things like uh, loaves of bread or you know, grains of rice, cups of rice, uh, glasses of uh, water, because saying rices or waters or breads is a different thing. <laughs> uh, it refers to kinds of rices and breads rather than uh, specific bread items. So we've talked about different strategies, different languages use to make plurals. When we look at this across a lot of languages and see what languages do what, we're doing typology, Gretchen. I don't know if you knew that's what you were doing right now. We are doing typology, yes. And there's a very cool website if you're interested in linguistic typology, which is the World Atlas of Language Structures, or WALLS. And they have all these interesting maps, pulling information from all these different grammars of all these different languages and putting it on a map so you can see, you know, how many languages have prefixes for their plurals versus suffixes for their plurals versus something else. Because plurals are one of those things that every grammar describes. If a language has plurals, even if it doesn't, it's such a common feature across the world's languages, it's often relatively easy to describe. It means that WALLS has, it's one of the biggest parts of the survey. It has over a thousand languages, which means that like 
one in seven of the world's languages are included in this survey, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, it, it is pretty good. It's, you know, not all languages even have grammars written of them or have been converted into walls, but that's, that's a pretty high ratio for walls. What do you think is the most common strategy in the survey of making plurals? Well, as a very Anglo-centric person, I'm going to say suffixes. Uh, you are correct. I don't know Ooh. how distributed the survey is. It could just be, if you look at the map and where the plural suffixes are, it is really obviously an Indo-European Europe kind of area phenomenon. Yeah, so it's not quite clear if that's just like Indo-European languages are more likely to be in walls in the first place, which is definitely true. And so if we actually just had grammars for a thousand languages of Papua New Guinea, probably this ratio would shift. But plural suffixes are very common, and the next two most common are plural words, so not using any kind of morphology, and plural prefixes, so putting something on the start of the word rather than the end. But of course, that's not the only options that you have. What are some of these other options? We talked about reduplication already. You can have a change in the tone of a word. So there are some African languages that have systems where the, the tone or the pitch of the word changes depending on whether it's plural or not. Oh, neat. Which is obviously very different to something like Mandarin tone, which more people are familiar with, where the tone can change whether it means a particular thing at all. Uh, this is used grammatically. That's really interesting. Uh, I didn't know people use tone for that. Another one of my favorite less common types of plurals is when you just have a completely different word that means the plural thing. Oh, yeah, that is super great. And it's a huge pain if you're trying to learn the language because you're like, okay, great. So instead of memorizing this one list of nouns and then saying, I add this thing to them, now they're plural. You're like, now I have to memorize two lists of nouns and all of their associations with each other. So it's a bit of a pain. But like, once you know it, it's very satisfying to be like, oh, yeah, actually, these are were once historically completely different words. And now just one of them is the plural of the other. It would be a very interesting language to have this feature, Gretchen. I don't know if there are any languages that do this for all of their plurals, but I think there are quite a few languages that do this in a few edge cases. And one of them is English. So English the singular is person and the plural is people. And those are historically completely different words. This thing happens across languages so often and across different parts of grammar that uh, linguists call it suppletion because one form just completely takes over and suppletes the part of the paradigm where the other one would be. Yeah, it's the same thing that happens in things like the English verb to be, which is be, am, is, are, was. And so like, why do some of them have Bs in them and some of them have Ws and some of them have neither? It's because they were once three different verbs. Just crashing into each other. Yeah, but that's that's verbs. We're not in verbs right now. <laughs> we're in nouns. I think people in person is a really good reminder as well that even though English would just fall into the walls category of a language that has plural suffixes with the S suffix. It doesn't mean that it doesn't occasionally use these other things like um, foot, feet, which is just a modification internal to the word, or person and people, which is the suppletion, or sheep and sheep, where there's no change at all. Yeah, so there are some words like that in English. Sheep, sheep, moose, moose. Emoji, emoji. Emoji is a really interesting one because some people say emoji emoji and some people say emoji emojis, which kind of brings us to the English side of like, do you adapt the plural for the way that you do it internally in a language, in which case it would be emojis, or do you make it more similar to uh, what the source language does, in which case it would be emoji? Because Japanese does not have the English plural strategy of just add an S to it. And one of the strategies that it does have, among others, is just keep the word the same. But I think the best known example of do you do the source language versus the target language in terms of plural in English is a certain little creature with eight legs. The octopus. The octopus. Which I just avoid talking about in the plural at <laughs> all to save myself a grammatical crisis. I admit that I have also done this. <laughs> so if you're going to pluralize octopus as if it's English, it was just octopuses. It's very easy. Um, but you also have a, there's a fairly long-standing tradition in English of when a word is borrowed from Latin, uh, to make the plural the actual Latin thing. Because historically, many English speakers, uh, did learn Latin, and so you want to show off your education by using the Latin form, even though it's in English. So if you're going to pretend that octopus is Latin, then you want to say octopi. However, there is yet a third complication, which is that octopus, in fact, is actually Greek. Octo meaning eight, and pus meaning feet. And so, Greek does not make things plural by uh, adding I to it. 
Uh, so in that case, there has recently become popular a yet even more obscure and yet even more pretentious, to be honest, uh, plural. Is this why you say octopodes? Well, this is where I used to say octopodes, but I have recently learned that apparently it is, for maximum pretentiousness, octopodes. You've out-pretentioused my out-pretentiousness. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Which just sounds like, I don't know, like you know, Sophocles and Euripides and, like, another Greek playwright, because I guess they are all Greek, to be fair. But Octopides really, <laughs> really sounds like he should be writing some plays. I'm looking forward to your Greek tragedy about octo octopuses. <laughs> about those octopus things. <laughs> sea creatures of all kinds. We've been starting to explore the different options that you have for plurals across languages, which is part of why linguists do typological surveys to see what other potential things that languages can do. But I find this kind of typology work is not just useful and interesting as a linguist doing linguistic analysis. It's also a really handy way to think about language if you're learning a language. Yeah, like when you're learning a new language, it's interesting to be more aware of sort of the search space or like what are some things that some languages do so that things are less of a surprise to you if a language that you're learning does something slightly differently. Uh, one of my favorite things in languages doing things differently is also that some languages don't have this singular plural distinction. They make other kinds of distinction in how many of something there is. Yep. So, so far we've been looking a lot at the form and where it goes or how it changes the word and if it's compulsory or not. But there, there is just more than single and plural. So between one and many, we have some languages that create specific forms as well. So we have some languages that mark there are two of something, uh, which is known as the dual, as in the duo type dual, uh, rather than the fighting type dual, or depending on your accent, the glittering one. <laughs> uh, I mean, duels are also done with two people, I guess. You fight a duel between two people. Mm, yep, fair call. The duel of tense is fascinating to me because Old English had a duel. Really? We squandered it? Yeah, we squandered it, except there are still a few words that are relics of the Old English duel that we use all the time in modern English. Mm, really? Is this going to be one of those, like, now my eyes are open, I can't unsee this moment? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not even obscure. Okay. So, Lauren, what's the difference between both and all? Both and all. Uh, both means two and all means everything. Yeah! So if I say both of us went to buy some books versus all of us ah. went to buy some books, all means three or more. You can't use it for two. All no. of us, you and me, Lauren, went to buy some books. No. No! Ah! <laughs> Another one is either versus any. Mm. I got either as a choice between two. So either of you can come. And any is a choice between more than yeah. two. I can't force a definition of any that includes only two. Yeah, yeah, like any of you two can come. You, you, you just can't say that. No. Oh, wow. I have this tiny, like, space in my brain that works as a jewel, and I never even thought about it. The third one is going to be really obvious. You also have neither versus none. Right. Yeah. So if either does it, neither also does it. Some people insist on a plural dual distinction between between and among, whereas other people don't have this distinction. Oh, that's what that distinction that they're trying to get at is. Yeah, but it's just like English doesn't really have a dual anymore, so do we still need it in these particular words? But there is still one in former versus first and latter versus last. So, you know, I, I read the, this book and that book, and the former was really good, but the latter wasn't very good. You can't do that with a list of three. Hmm, yeah. But again, those are more obscure. Both and all and either and any just really blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, because my intuitions are so strong there. Right. Like, imagine if we did this everywhere in the grammar. Like, we used to have pronouns. Most of the pronouns used to have singular and dual and plural forms in English. Like, I and we too and we all. And we sneakily haven't talked about pronouns at all, because obviously pronouns don't just whack an S on the end of things the way that most normal nouns do. English doesn't even have a grammaticalized distinction anymore between plural and singular in second person, you and you, which is why people innovate things like use or your. Well, I mean, formal English doesn't have a distinction. Yeah, formal English doesn't. You guys, you folks. Yeah, you know, so like the pronoun system is different and we, we did a whole episode about pronouns earlier. Uh, 
But yeah, English used to have a duel like everywhere. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and in fact, Proto-Indo-European, the ancestor language of English and most of the other languages spoken in Europe, with the exception of uh, a few, and some of the languages spoken in the Indian subcontinent, uh, it had a duel. And so there are a few other Indo-European languages that still have it or still have kind of relics of it. One of them was Latin, which had some fossilized forms, like ambo, which means both. So if you're ambidextrous, you have both hands mm. are the right hand. Yeah. And uh, also had uh, relic forms in Old Irish, Homeric Greek, Old Indo-Iranian, and Old Church Slavonic. And there are still a few dual forms in Slovene and Sorbian. And if dual forms encode two... You'll never guess uh, what they call it in languages where it encodes three. Some languages have a trial. These include Austronesian languages and Austronesian-influenced Creole languages, including Bislama and Tokpisan. Hmm, that's great. So they also have a dual, right? So you have a singular, a dual, a trial, and then a plural after that. In the pronoun systems, yes. Just in the pronouns, okay. Pronouns, obviously, because they're counting people. People tend to make a lot more distinctions and keep them in pronouns. I should say there are other languages besides Indo-European that do have duals. Uh, so in Nuktitut uh, and uh, Yupik uh, have dual forms, but Greenlandic doesn't, even though it's related, uh, but it used to. And in an entirely different part of the world, Kwekwe, Goab, uh, and other Khoi languages have duals in uh, some forms. So there are there are duels around the world. Uh, and there are some trials, but that is the most. No one has ever come across in natural languages something like a quadrille, which would be marking four. Qu quadrille, quintal, sextal, septal. No, and this is why typology like, is interesting. When you find like there are lots of languages with single and plural, there are some languages with dual, there are even fewer with trial, and we've not got languages that mark a specific number of anything more. But we do have languages that mark something that means a few, so something that's like more than two, but less than lots. Yeah, I really like this because English kind of does this in our in our measure words. Like you can say like one of something or a, a single amount of something. You can say a couple or a pair, which is two, and sometimes occasionally extended to be more than two. Um, like I'll be there in a couple minutes if you're there in three minutes. Eh, I think that's still in the thing. But people will really argue about this one. Um, and then we have things like a few. Uh, or a handful, or a bit. And then we have things like many and several and a lot, which kind of approximate the system as well. But some languages do this in the grammar. Yeah, some do it in the formal grammar from all over the world. It's definitely not one of those, like, it crops up a lot in this language family or that language family. It shows up in Hopi in North America, Walbury in Australia, languages of the Oceanic area, um, apparently in Arabic for some nouns. And it's so common that it actually has its own term, which is porkal, P-A-U-C-A-L. It's a very satisfying word to say, porkal. Yeah, I really like the word porkal. So you can look at number by strict sort of counting, and you can look at number by a few and a lot and many. Are there any other ways of looking at how many of something there are? So um, I may not have been completely upfront with you when I gave you the Nepali example about books. Okay. So I can point at three books and say kitab haru, but I could also point at like three books, a couple of notebooks, and some pens and say kitab haru, and it would still be technically correct. So kitab haru doesn't just mean books, because I can't use books to mean the plural of pens also. Books and associated materials. Ah, like books and stuff. Yep. So the Nepali plural is not only optional, as I said at the start, but it also has a slightly broader meaning in a lot of contexts. So I could say Gretchen Haru, and it would be like Gretchen and her family and associated peoples. Is this kind of like when you say, like, wishing you and yours a happy new year or something like that? Yes. Like you and yours is like you and your family or kinfolks or people that are associated with you? Yeah, that kind of, whatever that semantic meaning you have, that's kind of what Haru is doing in these sentences. Ah, oh, that's really interesting. It's a very elegant way of representing. We know you kind of mean this generally related content. 
One of the really nice things about plurality is that it's often something that is very easy to see in how it's marked and how it's used. So you can use things like Google Translate to play around. Uh, you can look at examples in things like children's books and you can begin to analyze plurals a bit like a linguist does as you're learning them and going about understanding a new language and having a little bit of terminology around what the typological possibilities are with plurals can make it a bit easier to approach them in a new language. I watched a demonstration of a monolingual fieldwork uh, scenario where you have no language in common with someone. And this was set up as a demo because the people did have a language in common, uh, but they set it up as a demo for the audience. Uh, and they pretended they had no language in common and tried to figure out some things about uh, the language from the volunteer. And uh, it was really interesting because it's fairly easy to ask somebody, you know, here's a stick, here's two sticks, here's three sticks. You can kind of point at them and people can generally figure out what you're asking and they can, you know, answer that. And so it's one of the easiest areas of a grammar to start, start approaching rather than getting into more complicated stuff about hypothetical scenarios and this kind of thing. It's uh, an easy thing to learn at the beginning when you're starting out learning a language. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch and gifts at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. And my book about internet language is called Because Internet. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. To listen to bonus episodes and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include surnames, linguistics fiction, and a Q&A with Gretchen about her book Because Internet. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We really appreciate if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. You can share your favorite Lingthusiasm fact with them, or you can share it on social media and tag us in. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our audio producer is Claire Gaughan. Our editorial producer is Sarah Dapirella. Our editorial manager is Emily Greff. And our music is Ancient Cities by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!